Hello and welcome to The Last and D, a board gaming podcast brought to you from three exciting countries today. Uh, so, I'm Alessio, I'll be your host today, and I'm joined here by Kara. Hello. And Fen. Hello. Fen is alive. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, everyone is alive. Everyone knows I'm alive, it's just sometimes not very well. We are, we are feeling like it. So, it's episode 95, and we'll be covering, uh, actually, a lot of time with this episode. But... Uh, yeah, hello, Pamcha. Oh my god, hang on. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, you can't the intro. I will find out what the heck this is about. I'm going to put. I think it's a very natural. Uh, the, the apocalypse is coming. Yes, yes. <laughs> Literally nothing. Yeah. She thought someone was coming to the door. There's nothing there. Better be safe than sorry. So, let's start again. We'll be covering today uh, a big time span in board gaming, actually. But before we start, let's go on with the usual standy catch-up. And it's more than one person today, so uh, <laughs> what are you doing, Fen? Oh, um, I'm mostly what I'm doing, I'm going to be covering uh, when I have my little talk, because it's been a uh, getting back on the wagon with regards to board games and, and everything. Right. And I've turned a... A ton of deliveries, so um, yeah, let's just say, the stuff I'm not going to talk about that arrived, Cycles 4 and 5 of Aeon Trespass Odyssey arrived. Yeah! Um, I realised I didn't order the uh, binder, and that was a big problem when I played through previously, <laughs> so I've contacted Marcin and we're sorting something out to, so I can pick up a copy of the binder. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be talking more about organisation in my section this is uh, it's become super important for me uh freedom uh what is it the sentinels of the multiverse board game arrived and let me I, I wasn't i'd completely forgotten and i hadn't opened the page up already in advance uh <laughs> so let me just check it's right we go it's not sentinels of the multiverse it's it's still published in greater than games and everything um, it is like Freedom 5. That's it. I, okay. I, I, I keep getting it mixed up because there's an old bo- uh, video game series called Freedom Force that I have <laughs> played like as a retro game. That's a hero. Um, it's a real-time strategy game, but you control heroes, and it feels more like that pre-MOBA kind of thing. Um, anyway, so I guess getting it mixed up. Uh, but yeah, that's arrived, and I haven't had a chance to have a go at it yet. Um I, it looks. I've looked at the rules, and it looks like it's actually really good. Um, and this was almost like looking like vaporware. You know, the way that the back half of Darkest Dungeon is never going to materialize now, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that arrived. And Trespass arrived. Um, I'm just just off a course of medication, so uh, that's already hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm gonna have to go back to the doctor and say you're getting it right, but you're not doing it right enough. However. Hmm. You know, we know what the problem is now, and it's it's treatable. So, yeah, it's been time. treated. Yeah. Um, speaking of illnesses, Pam's been doing her best to get uh, get ill. Um, <laughs> she's not allowed fatty foods, otherwise it upsets her quite badly, and she gets pancreatitis. Um, which, oh. yeah, you know, like it, it's it's serious if it keeps happening, but it's controllable and it doesn't need to happen. However, it means when I'm eating yogurt, which I was doing just before we started. She sits there begging for it, um, and I'm like, you can't have it. You ha-. She's become a terrible because she's constantly hungry now because she can't have fatty food, and so it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, but the rest of it I'll talk about in my uh, um, in my section. So that's kind of it, really, plodding along. A lot of Kickstarters coming in, and I'm finally getting back towards playing games. Uh, how about you, Kara? Um, yeah, so um, uh, considering the circumstances, I had an operation a while back and I'm still recovering and it's a slow process, um, but considering the circumstances, I'm doing okay. I haven't gotten around to, to playing much of anything due to the fact that I'm mostly spending my days lying on the sofa. Um, but I've watched a lot of Netflix. Um, have you ha- have you have you finally pulled the ripcord and watched JoJo's Bizarre Adventure yet? <laughs> it's on Netflix, and you you should watch it. And, and be aware. <laughs> no, I haven't. Do watch yet. the first two seasons. Be aware. Third season things get change a bit, but like four, five, and six, those mm, really worth. I love it so much, and you know, do do give it a go while you're stuck on the sofa. It is fun, and it is 
it is clever and at times it's really okay something special okay i mean i have another three or four weeks on the sofa in ahead of me so <laughs> yay okay i'll give it a give it a try um yeah i have gotten things as well i also got my ato shipment everyone got it yeah um i noticed i forgot to add the voice narration which i will do i think it was free for bakers um the the core not voice narration was free um but hmm. i forgot to add the one for the expansion um oh yeah um uh, anyway so um yeah um I mean, I'm still on cycle one, so it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, so so the co so the core voice narration is okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, apart from that, my house is 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 progressing nicely. Um, it's full of games. Yes, it's actually overflowing. Um, I I am running out of space now. I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> Um, well, yeah. No, I just did the donation to a local community of gamers. So you could try and do what I'm doing, Cara, which is I'm going through my collection and I'm looking at games and I'm categorizing them like as follows: of like uh, first as ones that I've played, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to play this again, and I'm I'm going to get rid of those if they're like hard. I'm not having them. But the second category is games I've i've played but i've not played recently and i'm going to keep them because then they have nostalgia and that's mostly because i remember times playing them with people and i don't you know i i don't live in my home country anymore so i'm keeping on that priority uh then there's the ones i'm keeping because i'm currently playing and the ones i'm keeping because because my partner wants uh, and likes playing them and that's worked really well uh we got rid of flamecraft recently because of that we sat what? down and played it again and went, nah, nah. And we didn't have any nostalgic memories to it. Kara will, Kara will never get rid of it. Yeah, I know, it's a personal thing, but that's helped me <laughs> uh, give me a bunch of like reasons to keep games and then some that I'm just like, okay, you know what, actually this needs to go to a new home. Okay, I have a, I mean, I agree with the first part you said to, 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 to do it like you do, but not with the rest because I just remembered I have an attic now. And, um, well, you can put them in the attic. I can just, then. yeah, I just <laughs> can fill my attic with board games, which is very <laughs> hard to access, but I will still have them. So, anyway, um, yeah. So, um, but mostly about me um, and my struggles with my sofa and my board games. Um, how about you, Alessio? What about my struggle with board games? Well, I have a room uh, full of games too. I just donated. I I began to do that uh, yearly. On December, I donate a few of the old games, uh, and on January, I'm still full of games again. So that's basically a struggle. I'm always doing like you all. I received the cycles four and five uh, Eon Trespass Odyssey. I did not. Uh, order the binder but I'm okay with that uh, I I know that there are a lot of uh, potential spoilers about that so I will start playing probably during the holiday break and that's almost it uh, nothing else I guess because I'm playing the same games as the last time so Steam Power from Martin Wallace which is still beautiful I stopped playing the gang because basically it became becomes easy very fast. I still playing fishing from Freedom and Freezer. I'm still playing uh, uh, the game I will talk about today, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is all from me. I think that we can party like it's 1997, right, Kara? 95. 95. Come on. 1995. Can yes. cannot be that long. Okay, let's talk about the popular game of... Catan! Settlers of Catan! Yeah, actually I just noticed the, the English title... It's just Catan, Catan now because we, we Settlers of Catan is no more because it did a colonialism, it's just Catan. Wow, how can you get an introduction so wrong? <laughs> yeah, come on! <laughs> okay, so... Um, Catan! <laughs> so yeah, um, Catan... Um, really weird for me because I have the German version here and it's just Siedler von Katar. That's the version anyway, I always think uh, of in my head. 
It's always that title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, um, first of all, why am I talking about this game? Um, two reasons. Number one, it's actually my most played game of this year, I believe. Um, wow. And when we um, cleaned out um, like a, a garage of my parents, uh, I stumbled upon a copy of the game, which I immediately added to my collection because I don't have enough games, as we discussed earlier. Um, and um, so, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who don't know the game, um, Catan is from 1995 uh, by Klaus Teuber, um, who has recently passed died. away. Yeah. Um, yep. Age 70. And it's yeah. Yeah. good man, dearly uh, missed. And it's, I, I, I suppose it's one of the the most. Uh, well-known German board games out there. Uh, yeah, I call it. I call them like landmark games. It's a game that significantly changed the direction of board gaming. Yeah, I think it's the the game that at the time introduced uh, everyone to modern board gaming, basically. Yeah, uh, that's actually uh, a while ago. I had a talk with uh, friends of mine, um, and we d we agreed that uh, Catan is kind of the the gateway game between like what uh, our kind considers casual gamers and us um, in a way that someone who's not really into board games can very easily pick up this game and play it and our fun. our kind our kind yeah. <laughs> oh no <laughs> i didn't know i was part of a kind <laughs> yes the kind of, of board game crazy people um and um, and on the other hand, people who are board game crazy can still enjoy it, which I realized over this past year. Um, I've played it uh, online with uh, friends on board game arena, and um, it's it's very simple, very fun, and yeah. So for those of you who don't know how it plays, um, you have an island in front of you uh, built up out of um, hex tiles. Um, each hex tile presents a different, well, technically a different resource. Uh, you have the um, wheat fields, you have the um, forests for wood, you have the meadows with sheep, which give wool. Yeah, wool. yeah, um, <laughs> wool. You have the clay pits, which give you, I don't, I think actually clay you I can collect you can collect peats from that uh... mm, i think usually it is clay yeah. <laughs> i think it's often also referred yeah, to it's as clay. it's clay it's yeah. clay yeah it's 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 officially yeah. clay and um you have mountains where you get ore not stone metal or not metal or or hey um, i'm guessing i have the italian version and um, yes, and in the middle of the island there is one special tile which is just a desert. So on these tiles you place markers, uh, like small chips, with numbers on them. Um, these numbers come in different colors, different sizes, and range from 2 to 12. Um, and that's, uh, I, as, a, as a math teacher, I really love this part of the game um, because it's great, it's teaching probability. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because um, the numbers represent the possible results of the die roll with two six-sided dice, except for the seven, which is a very special number because it's the most probable number you can get. And um, the bigger the number, on the tile is the higher the probability that this number gets rolled and um, the six and eight you know on second place in the probability ranking are in red additionally to mark them like hey this is a really good number um, <clears throat> you also start with uh, settlements 
Um, everyone has two settlements and two road pieces. Settlements are placed in the corners between the textiles and road pieces along the edges. And um, yeah, and in the desert is the robber. Um, so when you play, you start, uh, every player's turn starts with them rolling two six sided dice. The resulting number tells you which hex tiles produce resources. So if you, for example, rolled a five and you are lucky that uh, on the forest with the five on it, you have two settlements, you get two wood from this forest because five produces resources and five is on it, you know, you get it. And, um, <clears throat> and then you can trade um, and that's probably the um, most interesting part um, about the game, the trading. Um, you always have the um, option to um, trade four resources or four resource cards for one specific one. If you really need that sheep, uh, you can just give four wood and get a sheep. Um, you can trade with other players, um, whatever you want. And um, at, along the coast of the island, there are harbors, which give additional um, options. There is a three for one trade harbor, and then there are specific resource trade harbors. For example, if you have the one with uh, uh, wood on it, um, you can trade uh, for this resource with only two cards. No, you can trade two of this resource for something else that way. Um, what do you do with the resources? Well, you build stuff. You can build roads, you can build settlements, you can build uh, cities, which basically count as a double settlement. And... Um, Buy cards. And what? Buy cards. Yes, you can buy cards, <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> there are um, development cards you can get, um, which can have different effects. Um, the most simple one is, hey, this card is worth a victory point. Um, and yeah. And then it's the next player's turn. <laughs> um, you play until one player reaches uh, 10 victory points. Um, for example, each settlement they build is worth one victory point. Each city is uh, two victory points. Then there are victory points for, um, longest for building. Road. Hmm? Longest road. Yeah, for having the longest road or the most um, military power. In the development mm -hmm. cards there you can have knights and if you have the most knights you have the most military power that's in the expansion no that's not an expansion the military the knights are ah no the, okay no 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 the, yeah the the knights are actually cards in the in the base game of course yeah. yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my my bad my bad largest yeah, army and, um, yeah yeah and um yeah, so with building, there is uh, only one um, limitation, basically between two settlements or, or cities, um, there have to be uh, a free space. Yeah, so you can't build a settlement, one road piece, another settlement, but there have to be at least two road pieces between it. And um, it, everything has to be connected with your starting settlements. The starting settlements can be at different places, they don't have to be connected, but everything you build from then on has to be connected to what you already have. And um, yeah. So um, now, number seven. Um, <laughs> <coughs> the number that destroys friendships. Um, if you roll the seven, um, you get to move the robber somewhere. And um, the robber has two effects, first of all. When you move it uh, to a tile, you can steal a resource card from a player that has a settlement or city adjacent to this tile. So you can steal other players' resources. Yay! 
And um, and the other effect, as long as the robber is on a tile, that tile does not produce resources. So um, good luck with your number six clay pit. Um, if the robber is on there, haha, <laughs> <laughs> you don't get any clay. Um, yeah. So and that's basically the whole game. I think I don't believe I forgot anything important. The boards, but the, just the, if we the wharfs. Uh, the, the 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 tiles adjacent to see which allows you to exchange resources at a better rate. I mentioned those. Okay. I distinctly remember being confused. <laughs> <in the direction. laughs> so uh, I was abstracting. Today, today <laughs> I'm on my best my best day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we all have have a have a day today. Um. So yeah, um, that's basically it. It's um, very quick to pick up. In the uh, German version I have, the rules are one page, one square page, the size of the box um, with all the rules. So um, 40 by 40, like something like that. Yeah, let me check. No, it's more like 28 by 28. Wow. Um, <clears throat> And it's really going into detail, like each step uh, with all possible outcomes in detail explained. Um, why do you have a ruler on your desk? Why don't you? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I like it for its simplicity. Um, it's really quick to pick up, quick to play. Um, it doesn't take long to play a game, I'd say. I mean, Board Game Geek says, says 60 to 120 minutes. Um, I, I think sure one hour is can, fine, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how people can take two hours to play this game. By arguing, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Um, <clears throat> because you so, can trade. Um, <laughs> true. But, um, yeah, and it still has enough depth that um if you like more complex games you won't get bored easily i think and if you're really into it you can get a whole bunch of expansions i can't say anything about them because in my whole life that i've played Catan, i've never played any of the expansions uh, i have oh i got thoughts on those really very short thoughts i did too seafair yeah. is good citizen knights bad boom done travel Catan, amazing gimme <laughs> anyway, big recommendation from me. Uh, uh, I am actually of uh, most uh, forgiving, a more forgiving so, uh, if you don't attitude have it, towards the yeah, other expansion that you played, called. Try it. What? Uh, the, 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 uh, because I have the Italian versions, so I have both expansions, Seafarers and the other, which is called. Uh, Shitties and Kites. Okay, cities and knights. Okay, and uh, I kind there of are a lot of expansions. Yeah, no, th there are a lot of mini expansion. Of course, there's the Great River and other stuff. Uh, there is and the Soccer Fever expansion apparently. A and variants and variants like Star Trek Catan and stuff like that. So uh, there is a lot. Cities and knights. Uh, I actually appreciate the advanced. Uh, materials because uh, it takes uh, uh, another level of uh, another level of depth in the resources because uh, well uh, i think that we should just comment uh, what's the impact of the game because this game is seminal basically everyone knows that uh, but uh, the 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 real importance of the expansions is the fact that you can actually the, the system is so simple that you can work on that and make it something else which feels even completely different like seafarers with a little little change and it still works apparently there's even a scenario with the, where the map is the state I'm living it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now, f for myself, uh, I, the Cities and Knights has always felt like uh, trying to turn Catan into something that it doesn't need to be. I like Seafarers because mm -hmm. 
having separate islands that isn't adding to complexity and making me go why do we just play something else that's doing this job from the start it just expands the map and i think that's a nice fit in and the boats is kind of really fun as well the little trade routes um what i haven't played that i might revise my opinion on if i ever get a chance to would be no two there's the traders and barbarians and explorers and pirates which i don't know anything at all about um but I will say, I have actually also played the card game version of Catan, and I remember quite enjoying that as well. It was quite a nice sort of cut down of it, um, which felt really good. Ultimately, though, for me, if somebody's like, do you want to play a game of Catan? They'll be like, yes, sure, why not? You know, it's going to be, what, an hour? It's kind of enjoyable, it's fun, and sometimes you have really wonderful moments, like I will briefly tell a one in a, in a second. And if they go, let's play with seafarers, I'm also like, yeah, sure, but Cities and Knights is just adding... I don't need that extra complexity, and <laughs> the Barbarians can just make the game utterly miserable for one player. Like, if it's it's yeah. got that real sort of punishment of if you're behind and struggling, then you get slapped, and Catan already has enough of that. You can sometimes just take someone out of the game entirely with the robber at the right time. Or, to tell my Catan story, we go back a number of years... Uh, we're playing a five and six player game of Just Call Catan. Uh, I'm not going to name everyone who was there, uh, but I could. Um, but the notable thing is the board starts off and, it, and it's already gotten really cramped and people are having to make big compromises on where their second settlement is going. And Madog, um, a very great traditional Welsh name, if you've never heard it before, um, it looks like it says Mad Dog, but it's Madog. Um, uh, he uh, is unfortunately the position of being the player who has to place the last thing, so he, last settlement. So he places his second settlement on a rock port, and his first settlement is like on a hinge of two good uh, ore port, um, two good ore uh, um, <laughs> producing tiles with good numbers. My first turn, I buy a development card, and um, he looks at me, and he goes, "I swear to God, if you've drawn Monopoly." and you play Monopoly on Rock on your next turn, this game is done. And you already know where this story is going. Because <laughs> we generate, like, on Maddox Go, he doesn't get very much Rock, but everyone else generates a ton of Rock. He's well set up. And on my turn, I reveal Monopoly and say or or Rock, as we'd call it, and that was it for Maddox. And he was done. And I didn't do it to <laughs> screw him over, either. Um, I needed that because I was also in a tight position, very boxed in as well. It was a real knife fight in a phone booth situation. Um, but that's yeah, the kind uh, of moments where you're like, oh, yeah, this game could be really fun. He got incredibly mad at the time, but we did play through the remainder of the game. And um, I think he came like third in the end. I did win. Uh, I bullied people with the with my road. Basically, if you it, that's karma. Yeah, yeah bullied people with with my road and and grabbed various places. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was one of those moments that happens. Um, I have a alternate version of that where I was playing uh, back when I worked retail. I worked in a game shop while I was in university. We were playing on a Sunday, and I got robbed five times in a row while I only had two settlements, um, you know, ex excluding my own turns. <laughs> and I was just like, why? And it's because every single time I had like one card in hand left and it was exactly the card the person wanted. And it, it was just <laughs> like such a miserable experience. I don't know if Catan now has like a grace buffer where you can't rob the same person more than once. I don't think so. But that's that's the thing. It feels like for me, uh, those kind of fun moments, In I was really annoyed at the time, in hindsight... Uh, it was kind of hilarious. I know I've had a few years to cool off from it, like a decade or so. Um, uh, yeah, more than a decade. Oh, it'd be near, Could be two decades. Years, 15 years ago it was. That's when I was in university. 15 years ago-ish. Um, 2008? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, it can create those really fun moments. Um, I think that Catan is... It's what Monopoly wishes it was. And that's like, it's a good version of Monopoly. It's got that developing of properties. It's got that grabbing of space. You're rolling dice, you're buying things, but you also get to trade with people and negotiate and do other things. And that's what I think. I, I wish that the broader society would toss Monopoly in the bin and just go, Catan, this is, the, this is Monopoly now, you know? 
Oh, you stole my intervention. Yeah. I wanted to say exactly yeah. that. <laughs> uh, it's, I think it's a common sentiment that's often felt is, as a, as a more entrenched gamer, if some more casual people are like, do you want to play Catan? I'm like, yes. They say, do you want to play Monopoly? I'm like, oh, look at the time. Sorry, I can't. I don't have six hours. Yeah, yeah basically, if you have Catan and Carcassonne, you are basically the, the good guy gamer version of the one mm-hmm. with Monopoly and Risk. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I will say, uh, if anybody asks to play Monopoly Deal, I will play it. That's done in 15 minutes, and that has all of the good parts of Monopoly, and none of the bad. It's still not an amazing game, but actually it's the best version of Monopoly ever made. It's just a card-based Monopoly. <laughs> I completely missed that. <laughs> I mean, the, the real sad thing about Catan is that at some point they removed the nice wooden pieces... With yeah, I, I, no, no, thank you for me. Um, I had plastic pieces on the travel version, which I did own. Bizarrely, it didn't manage to survive the travel journey to Sweden. <laughs> Poor thing. Um, <laughs> what? I mean, what? I would, I would still have it because it was a small box. It was self-contained. You know, easy to travel around and transport. And what if you got like three people sitting about with an hour to kill, and you just want something casual to play what, in a cafe? It was perfect. Yeah, uh, I don't. I think that it got remade like twice, Catan. Uh, it got the luxified version with everything, with resins and one with plastics, maybe. Uh, Board Game Geek has um, for re-implementations, so not just remakes. Yeah, has, has thirty <laughs> options. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 30 different options, including like historical versions. We've got Rome, we've got Egypt, uh, Americas. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot. There's Star Trek. Yeah. And the interesting thing is when you look up Settlers of Catan, you actually land on a new version. And the old version is. Uh, Catan. Catan. So that was really confusing mm-hmm. for me, and now I can't find <laughs> it anymore. It's very there we are. Okay, spreading false information. Mm. That's our job. 2002 Catan Portable Edition. Oh, I could get a new copy for 10 euros. I'm still not going to do that. Ah, here, The Settlers of Catan, 2008. The 15 year anniversary edition. The. the um, yeah. The uh, my my old boss from my game store from my um uh, university days, he, oh bought and still owns the original three D version, um with all the like hmm. cast pieces and everything. Cadan three D, yeah. yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. it comes with cities and knights <laughs> as part of the whole affair, but no seafarers. Uh, I think it was in a, in a chest or something as well. It's super ridiculous. Yes, <laughs> I, I've seen it once in a, in a board game store it was he so he <laughs> got it for um he bought it and basically paid the shop a little like retail um the cost retail cost plus the tax so he didn't pay it was like 300 pounds at the time i can't imagine what it'd be like now so yeah anyway recommendation from us get it play it have fun let's continue yeah yeah okay I think it's fine. <laughs> we were t- we talk about we talk about Catan enough, I think. So uh, after the 1995, let's get to the uh, to an atmosphere like in the American 50s when there were spies and counter spies. There was the Cold War raging, and uh, we have that with Farris before because I'm talking about uh, Agent Avenue. Now, <laughs> Agent Avenue is uh, a game from Nerdlove Games. You remember them for uh, uh, Mindbug, actually. A very, very good one versus one card game uh, from An Idea by Richard Garfield and uh, actually executed by uh, team people in the Magic playtesting teams. So, Agent Avenue is uh, a competitive two player games which could which has a lot of variants and is a spy versus spy game living in the same neighborhood in the city of Oakfield now you are 
in the role of one of these two spies who are unaware of the other identity and they are basically trying to uncover the identity of the other uh, spy. Basically, how it's played, very, very simple. Uh, I will have notes about this later. But the game is basically a circular board with 16 spaces and two home spaces, one on the opposite end of the circle in the other part. You start at the uh, spaces and move your players in uh, clockwise in a clockwise order so that uh, you basically play tag with the other spy when you reach the other spy you won okay the first one reaching the other spy wins since you are moving in the same direction someone will reach someone else without getting reached at, the, at their uh, uh, in turn so basically this is how it works how it's played it's the most the simple and beautiful execution of I could you choose. Basically, uh, every you have a set of cards which are your agents in the agent avenue, and uh, these agents have uh, one to three numbers on them, which is the number of squares that you move. Uh, there is the first number, that's the second, and then the third. And when uh, you recruit them and you place them on your side of the of the board. When you place them on your set of the board, you uh, put them in a column with the other agents of the same type. Depending on the number of the agents of the same type you already have, you get the placing on that num on that space. For instance, if you have one agent, you put you execute the movement on the first space. But if you have two agents, you execute the movement of on the second space. If you have three you execute the movement on the third space, okay? This is very simple. Now, uh, how this combines is beautiful because the agents are... Uh, there is the one with increasing movement. There is uh, the daredevil, which gives you a lot of movement each time, but if you have three of them, you lose the game. There is the code breaker, which gives you small, small increments or makes you move... No, it gives you... Uh, let me check. It gives you no increments at all when you play it, but if you have three of them, you immediately win the game. And besides that, there are uh, all the rest of the of the agents. There are some agents which make you move backwards. There is the double agents which makes you move backward once, very very fast uh, onward the, the second time, and then backward again. And Basically, the game is played like that. How it's played? Well, you have a succession of turns. Your turn, your opponent's turn, and so on. In the turn, you do one thing, recruit, which is done by basically putting... Uh, when it's your turn, you pick one card and you put it face up. You pick another card from your end and you put it face down. The opponent picks one of the two cards and uh, you take the other. When you recruited, the you execute the you both at the same time simultaneously execute the action on that card like I described earlier, and that way you move. Now the game. This is the simplest way of playing the game. There is a the that's the simple mode of the game. You can play the full game, which is basically the same game with an addition of a black market. Black market are 15 cards which are in a market made of three face-up cards at a time and uh, there are four black market squares in the corners of this kind of circular rectangular circular board and uh, whenever you end in a black market square you can take a black market card which gives you either an instant power or a continuous power in uh, you execute that and you keep playing whenever you reach the other agent or you put together three code breakers you win if the opponent gets three their devils uh, the opponent loses so now you uh, understand from this how cool the game is because basically it plays in 15 minutes it's very fast 
you have a distance initial initial distance of eight squares to cover and you basically play a quick alternation of turns with the i could you choose method which is beautiful and uh, uh, at some point you will end up with a game of, of nerves absolutely wrecking because basically when you piled up two their devils and you have a code breaker uh, and you want to get the code breaker to win you put it face down and you don't know if the opponent will do or otherwise uh, whenever the opponent knows that you have two daredevils uh, and uh, you put face down one daredevil for him to choose because he knows that you cannot possibly put a daredevil there because it's too risky for you. Uh, you can put a lot of bluffing in this game and it, ga it gives for so... it lends itself for so tense moments that each game is beautiful, fast, quick, fun. And Basically, I ended up talking, telling you all about Agent Avenue, except that this, there is a possibly even fun more, even funnier mode to play it, which is in teams. When you play in teams, you are with a teammate and your opponent is alone or with a teammate, and they have each one a deck of cards, and uh, you basically play one card from your end and you have no way of telling your teammate what uh, what do you have in hand of what you expect your uh, your teammate to play and uh, your teammate without telling you what he has in hand or what he wants to play he plays face down the other card and the game is all like that of course the two cards are always uh, necessarily uh, required to be different and this is Agent Avenue. I like it a lot. Did I fast enough? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm enamored by the uh, artwork for the double agent and I have flashbacks to the Robin Hood no, uh, uh, animated picture, picture movie. Yeah, so. actually I was expecting fan to comment about how I always end up covering all the furry like games. Um, uh, no, it's... Um... <laughs> I, I, I'm very, <laughs> I'm I struggle to follow, I'm afraid. Um, it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm, um, I, I I'm, I'm you sitting choose. here being yeah. assaulted by my dog. Uh, and oh, so yeah. I couldn't pay attention at all. I got clawed multiple times. I, I, I get uh, a free pass then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We are great. At so the, the game has a furry artwork and there is a needlessly sexy fox lady on one side of the board. But Wait, why needlessly? Uh, needlessly, needlessly, absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think it's yeah, needlessly. I, I, I'll, I'll have, I'll have Intentionally. you know, I, I think it's very important to appeal to the furry community. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, uh, I, I'm very supportive of them. I have uh, I've uh, two furries in my role-playing group and one furry adjacent um, who I don't know if he's actually a furry or not, but he's friends with all the furries, so who knows? Yeah, so whatever flats everyone. Maybe, maybe they'll really like. Oh, yeah. I, I don't care about it to be honest. You yeah. know, it's, it, 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 never king shaming. No, oh, yeah. I don't know if it's even considered a kink in some cases. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> the daredevil is also pretty nice. Now, anyway, I think that we can all convene that I am the most uh, furry supportive person in this podcast since I cover. This is the second game I cover about that. <laughs> that he... Uh, okay, so, it's also uh, given that. Then what's your first owner? Oh yeah, you're coming. Um, what's my first owner? No, 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 no. I, I'm not <laughs> that. that okay, supportive. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, there you go then. <laughs> oh, I am a lone wolf with a scar. Okay, okay, right. Okay. <laughs> when uh, uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, the, I I appreciate you all for this moment. But I kind of called it on myself, so you I you, you didn't about have fishing. to bring this up. You you stood right on that trap door. You pointed at the <laughs> lever, and I'm not gonna not pull it. I'll pull it for yeah. you. So <laughs> whenever Agent Avenue is actually a recommendation, the 
the only real problem with this game is that uh, uh, like uh, Witchcraft uh, Moonlight Magic uh, that had the uh, complexity of 1 on Board Game Geek, I think, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is rated 1.5. I don't exactly agree with that because uh, it's true that uh, you have to just have a glance of the game and you know what you have to do, so it's very simple and light. But uh, the mind games you can play with this game are actually deserving a bit more, possibly. So it's another uh, it's another problem of the distinction between weight and actual depth. Uh, I think this game is deep enough. Of course, it's a 15-minute filler, so it cannot be that deep. But you can play it uh, four or five games in a row and uh, possibly with a teammate because it's beautiful. The moments you create when your teammate doesn't understand what you wanted to do or pulls out like the the, the, co- the, the face down their devil which may, might lose you the game and you lose because the opponent doesn't pick it. <laughs> like a clever trap backfiring on you. So... This game creates funny moments and it's beautiful. Okay, <laughs> fan in the meantime, fan published the 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 wolf uh, vagabond uh, from <laughs> Root on the on the chat on Discord. Come on, so. it's it's the ranger, and you've 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 it's... not only said that's your fursona, but also now you've made it clear that you play as the vagabond in Root, and I I I I'm very I disappointed. Never play as the vagabond in Root. I'm very <laughs> disappointed. Yeah, at least at least you. I, I, I will this play bats. That's nice. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I'm... I actually uh, figured something out right now uh, on board game regarding the weight. Um, there is this little question mark next to complex ra- complexity rating. Yes. And when you hover over it, it actually says it's meant to be a value for how difficult the game is to understand, not how difficult it is to play. Yeah, uh, although this varies because they, it's like... Uh, Chess should not have a complexity of around four because it's very easy to explain. Definitely, yeah. no, it's very, it's very simple yeah. to learn. Exactly, uh, Go should have a complexity of one. Well, you can go further. You can actually go to the Board Game Geek page and read about how they define weight. And basically, <laughs> it is. Huh? I don't know. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a vibe. <laughs> exactly. Oh my! Yeah, I see it now. Oh my! Exactly. Okay. But uh, this is a debate for another moment when we have time for it because it's already time to talk with Fan about actually a lot of things. I think we'll start with a simulator. Yeah. Okay. So KDM simulator updated today. Uh, I am going to be putting a video out on that next week because the uh, it's a pup date. Um, unfortunately, the gambler's chest didn't land. We got the Black Knight instead. Um, it's functional. It's got a few bugs, um, and it's got some unintuitive things in it as well. Uh, I uh, had a, a wild ride trying to figure things out, and already um, they have the they have put the three D terrain in from that they cast for Gen Con and everything. So you can use that. Uh, I'm not going to um, one because it's the thing where it's slightly bugging at the moment with regards to breaking pottery. That's not working quite right. But secondly, you end up with a grey board with grey miniatures on it, and I can't tell anything that's going on. So, like if I could paint the models, it'd be fine. Or if the board had colours on it. So I'm just going to be playing with the tile version. Uh, it seems nice, pretty functional though. So, uh, and my brief review of the Black Knight is. It is the best of the new expansions that has been released, <laughs> and it re- it is a yeah, essential for anyone who plays the game any amount of time because it replaces the hand, and everybody knows how tiresome that showdown gets after a while. The Black Knight never gets boring. So, <laughs> yeah. no, I actually uh, I, I love the 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 pottery and the Lostomir. Uh, the mechanic it's beautiful and uh, marvelously executed and. It's not even that hard to play against. So, yeah, it's funny because yeah. um, uh, I won't get into it in detail, but the Black um, Black Friday update is touting the Silver City as King Dress first dungeon, and it's like, no, you've already released one. It's the Black Knight. That's a dungeon. It's l- straight up a dungeon <laughs> crawl. You might not see it as such if you like 
don't really look properly, but it's a it's it's a dungeon. <laughs> it's it's straight up. You explore. <laughs> you flip up tiles. You can break things to get to new places. You can interact with pieces of terrain. It's simple. It's probably not a classic dungeon. Well, it's not a classic dungeon crawl, but it is a still in that umbrella. You know, but Kingdom Death is a dungeon yeah. crawl that pretends to not be a dungeon crawl. So, yeah. Uh, the boss is already out for you. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> speaking of dungeon crawls, I've had not one, but two massive failures with trying to get to play some. Um, League of Dungeoneers and Dungeon Universalaris arrived um, in September. Uh, League of, I read through the rule books of both. I'm very excited about them. The mechanics seem fantastic. I set up League of Dungeoneers. I started trying to do character creation. I looked around at all of these bits and pieces and this complete lack of organization. And I went, I can't play this. I need an insert. Because it's the same situation I had with Gloomhaven, where I couldn't play Gloomhaven until I got the Laser Ox insert, which then meant I could take everything out of the box and it would just be organized, always everything in its right place. And I could tidy it away nice and easy. I can't do that with this. My insert, the League of Dungeoneers, arrived slightly broken, and even if it wasn't broken, it wouldn't be good enough. Um, it's a big box. It doesn't use miniatures, which I really appreciate. It uses standees. And as I said, I think the mechanics look amazing. It's like a modern updating of Warhammer Quest uh, with hmm. not much more complexity, but some differences and alterations, and it's very, like, miniature agnostic, as in they go, hey, if you want to use your own miniatures in your own dungeon tiles and stuff, go ahead, and I like that. Um, but I ended up boxing it all up again because I was just overwhelmed. I, I would need to spend about €100 Euros on game tray trays in order to organise it all properly or buy myself a... STL 3D printer and print out an insert because I can't I can't play it as it stands right now it's too much um, so then I went to Dungeon Universalaris which again I read the rule book and it's really good the rules are really okay. really good it's in incredibly tactical and they had pre-generated characters do this yeah if you're doing a complex game and you still have character generation or whatever in it also just give us some pre-gens so I can sit down and I can just grab four characters and I can build a party. I did all of that and then I reached a point where I was trying to sort out the standees for playing and I realised none of them have the names of the creatures on them. They're shared between various <laughs> factions. They're only numbered and even then like there's gaps in the numbering. I spent two days organising all the standees and all the other bits and pieces before discovering that organisation didn't work. <laughs> I then reorganised them and then I looked at it and I went, I need an insert and packed everything away and put it away. Because again, same problem with League of Dungeoneers, I was, there's less parts. It's more complicated and there's less bits and I really like the look of it and everything, but I need a third party insert before I can touch it. And again, same problem, no 3D printer, so I can't print out the STLs that people have created for games like this that would solve my problems. So I'm stuck waiting. Plus, I'd like it in wood. So I went back and picked up a game that I started playing last year. Um, but I had to stop because I was very ill at the time. Uh, and that is Nova Aetis Renaissance that I'm going to call Renaissance for the rest of this. Because Nova Aetis is the world setting. Um, and Renaissance is technically the time period. This is one of those things like Kingdom Death Monster, where Kingdom Death is not the game title. Kingdom Death is the setting. Monster is the game mm -hmm. title. It's Monster. Um, we know that because yeah. the other games are Titans and Labyrinth, but neither have come out. And I guess eventually there'll be um, a Kingdom Death waifu pillow fight, you know, to properly round it out. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so Nova Aetis Renaissance is a 1-6 to six player but really balanced around four characters. Not really dungeon crawl, but dungeon crawl. Um, it is set in the uh, Italian Renaissance, so early 1500s, uh, when there was the Rome between war, war, uh, war, Rome and Venice, the war between Rome and Venice. Um, and it's like more inspired by tactical mission-based computer games, they quote Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre as the inspiration. Um, concept is you take a party of mercenaries starting out quite weak and you play through a bunch of missions, scenarios, 
um, that will unfold the story and branch off in a number of different directions. There's side stories. It's got all the classic trappings of a dungeon crawler, tile-based combat, character advancement, a world map that you pootle about in and enjoy stuff, um, and but there's more campaign sort of narrative. I've read the core story can be finished in eight scenarios, which seems really cool. Like, there's a ton of stuff, but if you just wanted to go through the main story and just play that, you could sit down and play this over, like, what, two months with some friends once a week and just have a complete story experience, but still more left to explore. And the main reason it's got back on the table is Aeon Trespass Odyssey, um, because I'm committing myself with these campaign games of, like, I'm going to paint all the models before I play, um, but I'm going to do it in segments. So... What I've done with Nova Aetis is I set up a scenario and I paint up the models involved in that scenario and I play it and then when I get to the next scenario I reset the process and eventually I'll gather momentum to the point that I just set up and everything's already there but it'll take a little while. There's 90 miniatures in the box. Um, I don't actually, I've worked it out, I don't actually have to paint all of them because first of all I don't need any of the extra heroes. I don't want some of the extra heroes as well. One of them's Altier from um, Assassin's Creed, which um, wouldn't Ezio have been the right choice? Is it um, maybe Ezio's later? I thought Ezio was the Renaissance assassin, but anyway, either way, Altier sucks. I hate him. He's a terrible character. I tried playing Assassin's Creed One and sold the game because Altier sucks. So should should that be Ezio Auditore? Yeah, that's what I said. It should be Ezio. Yeah. I thought it should be Ezio, yeah. yeah. But no, it's Alatir, yeah. for some reason. Um, Weird. If it was Ezio, I would be excited, because that's a genuinely good character. Um, <laughs> then the other ones, there's like a druid dude, there's a plague doctor guy, there's um, a Arabic lady, I think she is. Um, uh, and um, there's, I have in my hands right now, Medicio. Okay, who's mm. a dude in armor carrying a little gremlin baby and he's got guns. So it's the Mandalorian. <laughs> so you can hear my response to that. There we are. Bye bye, Medicio. You're on the floor now. <laughs> I don't care. So I've, I'm playing with base four characters. Um, I'm not going to go into big detail about the game as a whole, but I do want to briefly talk about the like system for the combat and the extra little pieces that they've done because they've made this very nice and narrative. So characters, first of all, they have like time, um, like time it's called, and that's the number of action points that they can spend. They have all the usual stats like attack powers and things like that. Combat, basically, you roll dice to beat an opponent's number, and when they deal damage to you, you roll to defend against a set number. So you only ever roll one set of dice, and it's like... Um, uh, Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror in that like you're rolling to try and get successes on the dice. It also uses D8s, which I love. I love D8s. Um, each character eventually unlocks different skills. Where, depending on which skills you pick, you can then upgrade the character on different paths. So like Rebecca is a sorcerer, like a trainee sorcerer. She can become a chronomancer, affecting time, or alternatively a necromancer. Um, be giving you an idea of a little bit of the fantasy flavour. Um, uh, Val uh, Valerio uh, can become a, I think it's a knight or um, a duelist, I think. Um, so the characters I'm playing are Valerio, who's effectively the party warrior. Sophia, who is the rogue. Rebecca, who is the sorcerer, the spellcaster. And Vincenzo, who... He seems to be dressed as like a... A holy man, but he also seems to be coded as a, like, alchemist. Um, so I think he's like a warrior priest type guy. He hits things with a sensor. He's the one I haven't got the best handle on what he's actually supposed to be. But he's in the party. Welcome aboard. Why you both have names to begin with a V, I don't know. But yeah. Anyway, the super cool part of all this is rounds take place on this thing that they call... The Horologium, and it is a clock, or so a rondel clock, with two hands on it. The big hand, um, tr like, moves behind... All the characters have tokens on each of the sectors, and so they'll start, say, um, in, like, Cancer, say, or Leo. You'll start the round there, 
Um, and then all the characters in that sector, they'll take actions and each point they spend like moves them forward around the horo horologium, around the clock. Um, so they, they move forward in time based on their actions. And then once everyone's finished in that section, the big hand will move forward and until it reaches the next group of tokens and then they do their thing. So instead of having that usual crawler thing of it's my turn, I move and I do my thing or I do my thing and I move or maybe I move, do my thing, move. Instead, you go, OK, well, I've got five action points and I'm going to spend them to do this, this and this. And then I'm going to kind of not do the rest or hold off a bit because I'm waiting for somebody else to do something else. And you, you have more interaction between the characters. And so it doesn't just feel like players go, monsters go, players go, monsters go. Um, and that's really cool. It also tracks the time of the scenario. Basically, the little hand has like follows hours on it. I don't think the scenarios take hours, but that's just the design of the thing. And it'll um, they'll push forward each time the big hand does a full loop around the track. And then once you reach a certain time, that's it, scenario over. So it's a really cool action point mechanic that does a lot of things. Um, and on top of that, the enemies, they don't necessarily just have default, I'm a ranged guy, I run away from you and shoot, or I'm a melee guy, I come forward and attack. They might have completely separate objectives, which is really sweet. As a made up example, you could be in a forest and there's a crazed like woodsman running around chopping down precious trees and he doesn't care about what anyone else is doing. He's just going to chop them trees down. So you, his primary objective would be to run to a tree and attack it. And he might only not do that if you physically block him from being able to get there, in which case he might attack you. And that's really cool that these that they feel more like adaptive and reactive and there's a whole threat system where as you do stuff they'll work out and decide which one of the heroes is the most threatening target that they want to deal with if they are attacking them so it's a lot of work to handle initially but once you get it internalized it feels there's so many different things that it's a really tactically deep and rich thing the game um, it's also got a paragraph book with little scenes and bits in it and sometimes you might go into a building and hide and then you'll draw a scenario card from this stack of scenarios and it'll be like inside the building and you'll have different things you can spend time on to have a look what they're doing maybe you're hiding in the building from some patrols outside or you're trying to find something quickly while a fight's going on uh, or whatever um, there's some really interesting cool innovations there so I, I I haven't played all the way through it yet. As I said, I'm taking it slow. I will come back and talk about it in a future thing when I finished. I'm probably going to write a full review on it. Uh, and th this is one of my two big projects. This one, and then I'm doing the full Aeon Trespass Odyssey five cycle run. And hopefully by that time, um, some more Kingdom Death, the death stuff has arrived, or I've actually managed to be able to not end up spending all my money on medication and uh, instead um, get a 3D printer so I can get to play the other dungeon crawlers that I really want to play because they both look really fun. Uh, it's a shame that it's my personal thing if I need a hyper-organised insert for a game like that, otherwise I just can't handle it. Uh, yeah, so that's a very brief thing of Nova Aetis Renaissance. Um, I genuinely think... If you like dungeon crawlers and you want something tactical and rich, the base box is incredibly well organised, has a load of stuff in it, and I think it's a really fun game um, that's worth having a look at. So, uh, yeah, I, I have a recommendation for that. Um, and we're pressed for time, so finally I'm just going to give one really fast recommendation, um, which is a Steam game that landed... Last week I picked it up. It's called Menace from the Deep. It is a rogue-like deck builder with a Cthulhu framework to it. Um, it is really uh, nicely put together, um, graphically very pretty. And it's the first game since Slay the Spire of this rogue-like deck building that I've played. And I've gone, hey, not only is it feeling that scratching that itch of combos and interesting builds and everything and varied characters it has a nice system where the more you play cards they gradually upgrade uh, it's got a campaign mode with a little story where you unlock things as you go along or it's got a jump straight in 
like custom mode where you set up, you run, you have a go. There's three different characters with like six different decks each. So there's a ton of things to explore. Um, and the art style is absolutely gorgeous. So if you're looking for a game that will scratch the Slay the Spire itch, um, and I think Slay the Spire has proven that it's very much a board game in digital form, especially now it's a board <laughs> game. Uh, in board game in board form. Game form yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at getting... Uh, getting the Slay the Spire board game, I think. It's come back into stock at my uh, local store. They've got 20 copies. So maybe there'll be one by January where I could possibly afford it, but it's like 100... And... What's up? 1,400 kroner? So about 140 euros? Yeah. Um, so uh, um, I will have to see. But until then, that's a... A recommendation from me, if you're looking for something because you love Slay the Spire, but you've played it a lot, I think this is offering something that's similar but also different. And um, it's really good. And it just proves that even though H.P. Lovecraft was an absolutely worthless, terrible human being, the fact that he made the Cthulhu <laughs> mythos uh, open source, so to speak, means that people can take the franchise and make stuff with it that doesn't have all of his racist trappings hanging off it. Um, and, and this is quite a good one of that. So that's my my video game recommendation. If you've got, what is it? It's about 15, 15 Euro, euros? Yeah, it's just, a, I think it's just, a, it's um, 16, 16 euros 49 on Steam. Um, so there we are. That's my... Yeah, all of this has closed, so possibly we'll give it a shot. Yeah. Um, I've played 15.2 hours since I got it. I'm definitely going to play it a load more. <laughs> I think I'll go for the trying to do all of the 66 Steam achievements. I'll see how close I get to the end and then stop. But it's really nice to pick up and go, I've got like five, ten minutes I can play here and it'll even like, let you pause your run and come back to it later after you've reopened the game, which is nice, you know, so... Yeah, there we are. That's uh, that's everything I've dealt with. Two games that I failed to manage to play, um, even though I desperately want to. Uh, maybe I'll, I'm going to have to just get a 3D printer next year, a, an STL one to go with my photo resin one, I guess. Um, a game that I will, I'm going to be playing and I'll come back to, but it's going to be a while. This is going to be a slow project. Uh, yeah, and a video game that I think is, is really good. Great. So... That is about all the time we have today. So uh, remember that you can catch us up on uh, patreon.com forward slash the last and or on our Discord channel that is publicly accessible, or you can get an invite on our Patreon page. And uh, uh, you can also listen to us, actually you're listening to us, so you know, but on YouTube or uh, Spotify or whenever. I, while I'm talking, I'm reading the stuff in the recording chat from Cara and Fen, so I'm pretty easily distracted, but it's a goodbye from me, Alessio, and from Cara. Bye. And Fen. Bye. And when you are doing, <laughs> when you are done with this furry nonsense on the chat, uh, we have been this time again uh, the last time. And remember, the first S stands for sheep.